Well, I'm uh, Aaron Highwarn, your Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas Ottawa Regional Coordinator and your host for this evening's Tweetorial a Region 24 educational event. In the previous tutorials, we heard about the atlasing experience, we examined habitat and behavior, and considered identification by both sight and sound. Well, this evening, we'll be pulling all of this together and concluding this series of four tutorials by examining atlasing strategy and approaches. When considered as a series of four presentations, you should be better prepared, uh, or if you've atlas before refreshed, ahead of the peak breeding season that is just around the corner. I believe that a great deal of what you will hear this evening will be, a val uh, will be of value to those of you who will be serving as principal atlasers, as well as some of you who will be serving as principal atlasers for the first time. But I'm also confident that those of you who will be participating in the Atlas as general atlasers, anyone who is registered in the Atlas as a participant can enter data anywhere in Ontario at any time. I think you're also going to find this evening quite informative. Atlasing makes you observe birds in a wholly different manner. And I think what you've heard over the past few weeks might also be making you just a little bit of a better birder. Our intent remains to keep things light and informative and leave plenty of time for your questions. The success of the tutorials is founded in your participation and engagement, so please join in. If you have a question, feel free to post it through the chat feature. I'll be helped again this evening by Vince Fison, uh, who will keep an eye on the questions. I'd now like to introduce our guests, starting with Manmohan Panasar, who has been birding for about 30 years, including spending two full summers doing field work in northern Alberta and shorter stints at Long Point, other locations in southern Ontario, and of course here in eastern Ontario. He has conducted hundreds of point counts, as well as spot mapping, nest searching, bird banding, and breeding bird surveys. In the last Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, he was a member of the Eastern Ontario Regional Committee along with Mark Gaughan and two others, as well as the principal atlaser for the Urban Ottawa Centre Square, that's Square TVR 42, which he'll be serving as principal atlasers again this time around. Although as passionate about the natural world as ever, he heads out in the field less often as he likes these days due to two children at home who think that birding is, well, boring. Unbelievable and shocking, but apparently true. Regardless, he'll be recruiting them to help with Atlas work. During the day, Manmohan teaches two rambunctious groups in a grade six French immersion classroom and spends his flex time recovering from his day job and family life by puttering around his vegetable garden, cooking, reading, listening to weird music, and producing and hosting a radio program on CKCU 93.1 FM here in Ottawa. But before we hear from Anmohan, I'd like to introduce Mark Gaughan. Mark likes Lareds and a wee glass of scotch. Born in Quebec and raised in Ontario, he's worked for and with many acronyms, including CPR, CWS, UNEP, GEF, GBD, WTO, ITC, IEF, CD, CDA, DFT, and GAC. He's lived in Kenya, Barbados, and Switzerland, and has traveled extensively on work or looking for birds sometimes both. Mark was a two-time member of the Ontario Provincial Records Committee and set the Canada Big Year record back in 1979 and is currently eBird reviewer for five Eastern Ontario counties. Mark is now participating in his fifth atlas and when asked truthfully he replies black cap chickadee to that eternal question what is your favorite bird? So Mark over to you. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you, Aaron, and uh, welcome, welcome all. We'll we'll try and make this uh, as painless as possible. Uh, as Aaron has said, you you've been on a voyage of discovery. You started off with the uh, the joy of atlasing and you know uh, the fun of atlasing. You worked your way through some of the tools, and now you're all primed up and ready to get out there in the field. And so that's what uh, uh, Mam Mohan and I are going to try and help you uh, sort of uh, accomplish. Uh, I, I I sort of glanced through who's online, and I recognize some of you as uh, you know, uh, uh, experienced atlasers, so you can correct everything that I'm about to say and tell me you know, much better strategies. And I see some people who uh, I don't recognize and I'm hoping that some of them are, are new, new, new to the game and, uh, and you know, your voyage of discovery uh, starts, uh, starts, uh, starts now, I guess. 
So look, I've been on now, this will be my fifth atlas. I've seen a bit of evolution. We've moved from pencils to iPads, horse and buggies to hybrid cars, uh, from uh, less atlasers with more squares to more atlasers with less squares, uh, from a whole of square data collection to a much more pointy model uh, this time around uh, with a, a emphasis on point counts and surveys and so on and so forth and different data gathering techniques. Uh, and that history sort of influences how I think about atlasing. Basically, square bashing is in my DNA because that's how we had to go about doing it uh, 40 years ago back, back in the day because we had so few people that many squares only had maybe three or four days of solid coverage over the five-year period. Uh, so that will influence uh, some of the stuff I'm going to go over today. Uh, but, you know, the fundamentals are the fundamentals. And uh, I hope that a lot of what, I, what I'm about to uh, go over will sort of be helpful and give you a few ideas about how you might want to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to go about this, this monumental task uh, of citizen science. So I'm gonna try and do something which inevitably doesn't work. I'm gonna try and share the screen. Uh, so I have to select the screen. Uh, then I have to try and get back here. And no, nope, that's not it. That's it. That's not it. How do I get back here? It worked perfectly before. Uh, it's working, Mark. We can see your slide. You can? Okay, excellent. I can't. That's the problem. Okay, so I can now. And I can see you guys all sort of lined up in a, in a corner. So, you know, uh, Number one, job number one is get to know your square. And so I'm sort of assuming that most of you will concentrate on one square. Perhaps some of you are prin principal atlasers, perhaps some of you are not. Uh, but sort of getting a sense of what's out there and how to approach it uh, is key. And in this, in, this, uh, in this, your map is your best friend. You know, but getting there matters because, you know, anyone who's done uh, orienteering or map reading of any sort knows that what's on the map isn't necessarily what's on in, out there in reality. So, uh, so what are you looking for uh, when, when, you're, when you're looking at these maps and, and how does that impact your strategy? And so in a word, it's habitat. And if I was to add a second word, it's access to habitat. And so we're, we're really fortunate in Eastern Ontario. We live in a place where most of our squares, with the exception of uh, Mamo Hands, central Ottawa square, are mosaics of habitat, right? And so if you just look at this square, you can see we've got a lot of forest and we've got a lot of fields, right? And so that's, that's your first, that's your first, uh, that, that's the first sort of takeaway when you look at it. Uh, so, but before I dive into, into, uh, in, into this a little bit better, uh, a little bit deeper, uh, let's just sort of go over some of, some of, some other, some other ideas I had. Uh, so you're looking for habitat, you're looking for access routes. Uh, the other ways to get to know your square, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm not just saying this because I'm an eBird reviewer for several of these counties, uh, but because it's a really great tool. So use eBird. Uh, I've already had at least one conversation with somebody who, you know, has picked up on a really interesting bird in their square because they were surveying what, what's been seen on, on eBird. And so they, they've discovered that gray partridge has been seen on their square. So that will help them zero in on what is actually quite an important bird for us to understand, you know, what, 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 what's happening with their population in this part of the world. Uh, another tip, use social media and you can use that sort of passively or aggressively. Uh, in, in my part of the world, you notice this is in the, uh, uh, you may or may not recognize the area. This is the, uh, uh, this is the Bonshare Ridge just west of, uh, of Renfrew. Uh, you're sort of in the, you're in Renfrew County and so you're in the zone of the Pembroke Natural History Club. And so they have a really good active social media page uh, with people who report birds all the time. And so if you start to see people reporting birds from in and around your squares, well, that might be, uh, you know, someone you might be able to reach out to or start communicating with and having a little bit of a dialogue with, particularly if you're the principal officer. Uh, another point uh, I'm very, uh, very keen on, and this works particularly well in rural areas, is reach out to locals. Uh, you know, don't be shy. 
uh, but be prudent. You know, there are some strange people out there. Uh, but you know, if you if you if someone stops and asks you, "Are you broken down?" Uh, you know, then that's that's a that's a that's an invitation to have a conversation. And so, explain to them what you're doing, uh, and and then start asking them questions. And it's amazing how much people open up and how how much valuable information you can get. And then you can also talk to them about access. Who owns that Fort Woodlot over there? Do you, oh, it's you. you know, and you can start talking about, well, can I come in at some point to, uh, to, to have a look around? Uh, and also, this I'm actually thinking of something that happened with Aaron a couple of years ago uh, in a different context uh, when we were doing a winter count down in the Winchester area. And we stumbled across, or Aaron stumbled across and almost into uh, the now famous uh, Moorwood Bog. And then sort of doing some research, discovered that it's a conservation area. And then you reach out to the conservation authorities who are sometimes super interested that somebody actually cares about, you know, their, their land and is actually out there doing things. And they can, again, uh, share all sorts of interesting information and stories and, again, maybe uh, tips on how to access and get into it. So, so those are just sort of a few tips about how to get to know your square. Uh, and, and this is a sort of organic process that will happen over the, over the years that you put into, into the project. So now when we're looking at the, at the square from sort of like a habitat and strategic point of view, you remember earlier I said, well, there are always the X, there's forest and there's fields. So that's sort of the macro level. So automatically, you know, okay, I got to spend some time down here, picking up some field birds. I gotta spend a lot of time up here in the woods, get there's more birds in the woods than there are in the field. Uh, but y'all, there, the, the next thing to do is to think about it from more of a meso point of view, uh, which is thinking about different forest types. And so in, uh, in our part of the world, we actually, again, are, are very uh, fortunate in that we uh, have two basic biomes here at play. We have, we have uh, a bit of boreal forest and we have uh, Great Lakes forest. Uh, sadly, in my square, no boreal forest uh, as it happened. This is all uh, considered uh, Great Lakes. Uh, but if you'll notice something here, you'll notice there it's, it's a ridge and you can't really see the topography here, but on other maps you could see the topography better. Uh, you'll notice that it runs on an east-west uh, axis. And so uh, immediately you can sort of think, huh, okay, I've got a north slope and I've got a south slope. Uh, and I can tell you from my ruckies that that, that borne out in, in reality. On the north side, I've got what looks like a northern biome. And so I'm thinking uh, it's black spruce, mixed forests, uh, mixed alders and aspens and all that sort of stuff. Great habitat for stuff like magnolia warblers, black sort of greens. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, any other uh, Cape May warbler, maybe if I've got some nice solid stands of conifers. On the southern side, I've actually got some steep slopes here, and I've got sort of oak pine, sort of maple uh, forest growing in here. So southern birds, so yellow sort of vireos. Maybe if you're super lucky, yellow billed cuckoo. Uh, uh, we might have. Uh, uh, hermit and wood thrushes down here, where it's on the north side. If we're really lucky, maybe there'll be a pocket of Swainton uh, thrushes. Did I say warblers before? I think so. Swainton's warblers. That was like that was like a, a slip. <laughs> that would be uh, that would be exciting. Uh, so again, so just in the thrush world, you've got an interesting idea. You 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 can pick up your wood thrushes down here and be in active listening mode for Swainton's up in the northern half, where you might get some more boreal type elements. Uh, so that's a mess up. Uh, now, the fields here, you think, oh, great, this is going to be a fantastic square for field species. You would be wrong. <laughs> uh, if you were over in the next square over, it would. But this square is intensively farmed. And so that's, uh, that's an issue for a lot of Ottawa, particularly east of the city. Uh, there's lots of good looking field on the map, but very little of it is actually particularly bird friendly. Uh, so you'll get savannah sparrows and red-winged blackbirds and so on and so forth. But those key sort of old field sparrows just are not, uh, birds just aren't here. So, uh, so this again suggests that what you want to do is you want to be patrolling around here, not just randomly checking uh, fields, but looking specifically for old field systems where there's old shrubbery and stuff like that growing in the fields. And there, that's where you will pick up maybe uh, field sparrows and uh, brown thrashers and vesper sparrows and 
and who knows what all else. So that's sort of the meso, right? So you're, now you're into your forest, you've got lots of different forest uh, uh, bio, uh, e ecosystems, you've got different field ecosystems, each one of which has different sets of birds in it. Uh, and you wanna like, instead of sort of relentlessly patrolling the bar line, which takes you through all sorts of wonderful corn and soya fields, you might wanna be on some of the, uh, some of the, the smaller roads off to the side here. And just uh, by historical knowledge, I know there's actually an old field here that has clay colored sparrows in it. Uh, uh, so that's, that's an area that I will, I will focus in on. Uh, so, so that's it. So you're looking for those different forest types, old field systems, and critically important, any wetland. Uh, some of our squares are blessed with fantastic wetlands around the Richmond area, for example. You'll have no trouble finding soras and Virginia rails and leaf bitterns and so on and so forth. But once you get into some of the more well-drained areas, not so much. But if you look in the forest here, you'll see it's just a myriad of little, uh, little ponds. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's something you'll want to key in on. You'll want to be able to visit those little ponds, go in there, check to see which ones have hooded mergansers, wood ducks, maybe ringneck ducks on some of the bigger, bigger lakes. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, you might find a eutrophic lake with uh, uh, blooming teals and stuff like that on it. Uh, you also notice here, this lake here. So again, bigger lakes are worth investigating for because they often have a different avifauna. So this big lake here could well have breeding loons on it. Uh, there are possibilities of colonies of ringbill gull or double crested cormorant or if you're super lucky, common turn. So that's part of the muskrat lake system if you uh, know that part of the world. So it's small and it's got a lot of boat traffic. So I'm not sure uh, if there'll be much on it, but it's worth checking. Uh, so so that, that's sort of the meso level. Then I wanted to stop uh, on the maps with sort of the third level, which is the micro level. And here's where it gets really interesting, I think, is that there are, there are tiny features that you should be looking for as you're atlasing, and you could see them often on maps, but sometimes you won't get it until you do your recce in the field, is certain features are good for certain birds, right? And so here you see there's a little road going through here, it's the Bonshare Road, and it passes over the Bonshare River, which is pretty useless for birds, but a little bit of a corridor. But there's a bridge. So bridges are important. Bridges are where cliff swallows nest, uh, rough wing swallows. Uh, they're often good for uh, uh, Phoebes, American robins, whatever. So, you know, little bridges over little rivers are always worth checking. Uh, and I, my last atlas experience was uh, uh, on the Quebec side. And in many, many of my squares up there, you're off in the forest now. And some of the tough birds are things like rock pigeon. You know, this is where they are. They're at the bridges over the rivers. You know, so I had several squares where my only rock pigeon on the square was at that bridge, not this particular bridge. Uh, so that's, that's just one thing to look for. Another one you're looking for is pits, sand pits. Sand pits are great. Uh, obviously, a good spot for sand martin or, or a bank swallow, uh, rough wing swallow, again, you mentioned that already, kingfisher. Uh, kingfishers will often nest in, a, in, a, in an old aggregate uh, mine or pit. Uh, and also aggregate, pit, aggregate pits often have a uh, small wetland in them. Uh, think of the Moody, uh, the Moody pit, which is one of Ottawa's premier birding spots. Well, sometimes this could be maybe the only place where spotted sandpiper nests on your square. It could be that little pond in the, in the middle of an aggregate pit. Uh, and also they tend to be surrounded often by some unused, weedy, scrubby land. And so I've more than once I picked up things like grasshopper sparrow or clay colored sparrow, just in the weedy edge of, of one of those places. Uh, old towers, another thing to look for, uh, abandoned bar, uh, buildings for things like turkey vultures. So keep an eye out for some of these micro features, which uh, are, are sometimes, uh, you know, where that unique uh, uh, bird is. And if you look at this map, one thing you won't see is any town. So unlike some other people, you know, getting urban birds is actually going to be a bit of a stretch on this, on this square. So uh, house sparrow is easy, they're abundant out there, but, uh, and rock pigeon, but some of the things, cardinals, house finches, uh, Carolina wrens, uh, these are not birds that are going to be easy to find out here. Again, that's where 
talking to the locals comes in. You know, if there's someone with a bird feeder, that's an invitation. Go talk to them. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a tale from the field about talking to people, and it comes kind of goes back to the uh, the last atlas. So uh, I, I'm very keen on uh, on nocturnal birding. It's one of the things I love doing, uh, particularly when my hearing was better than it is today. Uh, so I was out owling, and I decided to take my daughter. So this is a you know those of us who are trying to entice people out. She was uh, at the time she was maybe 12 years old. So there, there, there we are. You know, me with my 12-year-old daughter, off in the wild near Winchester, uh, deep in cannabis growing country, uh, and uh, listening for owls on the side of the road at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, lo and behold, this monster truck comes by, big lumbering. I don't know, some sort of pickup truck. And inside this monster truck is this monster guy who I swear must have weighed at least 300 pounds. And I sort of, and he stops and he sort of looks at us and I thought we were going to die. Uh, but th then he asked the question, so what are you doing? Are you in trouble? And so I said, oh, I'm listening for owls. He says, oh, have you heard the screech owl yet? <laughs> so, you know, I got permission to look on his land. We found out about some nesting screech owls. It was just a you know great source of information. Not necessarily recommending that as a information gathering technique, but you know just be open to the possibilities. So you know map reading 101. That's it. Uh, the next topic I wanted to touch on was timing. So like anything in life, timing is timing is key. Uh, and there's two two elements to to timing that I'd like to go over. One, every birder knows it. It's in your DNA, right? It's time of day, right? So obviously, dawn, pre-dawn. This is when you get your dawn chorus. That's when everything's singing. You want to be out there before dawn if you can, and as often as you can. And you want to survey different habitats uh, before dawn too. Uh, don't forget those old field habitats. They can be really productive if you listen before dawn. That's sometimes where you pick up. Uh, some of the more interesting uh, field birds that you might miss, like maybe a sedren. Uh, and in the forest, obviously, the dawn chorus is one of, you know, nature's great, great spectacles. Uh, don't forget about the evening chorus. Uh, and often, I actually find sometimes it's easier to hear some birds in the evening chorus uh, because there's less background noise. <laughs> and so you just, you can pick out things you didn't pick out in, in the morning that just got obscured by the, the layer of thrushes and robins sort of that drowns everything else out. Uh, and then my note here says noon, not just for napping. Uh, you can apportion your time, and this is critical if you've only got a day or two to cover a square. Uh, noon is when you could hit areas like sewage lagoons, ponds, open fields, do those long distance scans. Uh, it's also, you know, the birds will slow down, but it's often a very busy time of day for birds who are collecting food for youngsters later in the year. Uh, and so you can get a lot of confirmations and we'll talk about the different codes uh, later uh, in the next presentation. Uh, but even more important is time of year and time of day is time of year. And so you've heard a lot about safe dates and you'll hear a little bit more about that today. So I won't sort of go into that, but there's also best dates. And so, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, and it varies according to what your objective is. So your, your, your best dates for maximizing your species count are late May to early June. So that's when you wanna be out, you know, ears open, out at dawn, listening for that dawn chorus, picking up that maximum species diversity on your square. Uh, it's phenomenal how quickly the song levels uh, drop over the course of the summer. So you'll, you'll start if you're 100% in the first week of June, you know, about halfway through June, you're, you, you've knocked off 10, you, know, you knock off five or 10 species of your chorus almost with every, every week. So of course, by early July, you know, virtually nothing is singing anymore. Although there are some birds that sing later in the year and some birds that sing uh, earlier in the year, you know, depends on the individual, uh, the individual species. Uh, but don't, don't, don't stop atlasing when the birds stop singing. That's, that's critical because once the, the species acquisition curve, if you will, sort of levels off, that's actually when the confirmation acquisition curve ratchets up. Uh, and so late, uh, late June, July, even early August are fantastic times to confirm birds. Uh, sometimes the second week of August, there's still multiple families of birds out in, 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 on these squares uh, actively foraging. And, and, uh, and you can really rack up good confirmation levels by late season atlasing. 
being cautious to uh, weed out and not, not include birds that are clearly migrants. We'll have a, a conversation about that later. Uh, and off peak, so off peak, not just for owls, okay? Uh, this is something I really want to emphasize. There are, there are, there's a whole suite of birds that tend to start, do most of the singing early in the season. And so one of my favorite examples is brown creeper. You know, brown creeper in the middle of May is a slam dunk on any square in Ottawa. They're just singing everywhere. They're easy to hear. Uh, you just hit the right habitat. Uh, by the time you get into like the formal atlasing season, the peak atlasing season in, in, in early June, they pretty well shut up. <laughs> You know, and, and it can actually be one of the tougher birds to find. So it's a, that's a, a good example of a bird that sings early in the season and not so much later on in the season. And if you're worried about, you know, maybe it's a migrant, I'm not sure. Well, if you're spending a lot of time on the square, you can sort of note where you saw it and go back later in the, in the year and, and try, you know, have a concentrated effort to try and find, refine that, that brown creeper you had singing in mid-May to see if it's still there. Uh, and that's where Kate, Tapes can actually come in quite handy. I'll, I'll have a couple words to say about tapes in a, in a minute. Uh, the final chunk of my uh, my my uh, my thoughts today is sort of about switching into Atlas mode. So going into Atlas mode. And I had a conversation the other day with Dan Simpson, and we were talking about this. And and he said, well, you know, most of the time we're not bird watching, we're bird identifying. And I thought, well, that's, that, 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 that's an astute observation because that's sort of what I do, right? And you're not actually looking at the birds, you're just identifying the birds and sometimes just moving on. Uh, atlas, at, to be an effective and a, uh, efficient atlaser, you have to switch into a slightly different, uh, different mode. Uh, and so I like to think about that as birding every bird, but be tactical, right? So by being tactical, what I, what I mean to get there is use some of the square resources, and Aaron will go over those at the end of today's session, uh, but particularly the, the square summary sheet, it will tell you what was there before on the square. And so that's almost like your starting point. Okay, grasshopper sparrow was here last time. Maybe they're still here. They may not be, you know, some birds disappear. I've got sort of a sad story about my clay colors that I can bring up on that. Uh, and always be aware of what, particularly if you're the principal atlas, or keep in your mind, and different people have different ways of doing this. I, I love using the, uh, you know, printing up a cop, the latest copy of the uh, square summary sheet and using highlighters to highlight the ones that I think are still there that I haven't seen. But, you know, think about what, this, what hasn't yet been recorded on the square and have that in mind so that as you're going through and you hear, you know, that warbler that sounds like a yellow, but it isn't thinking, ah, I don't have chestnut sided yet. Maybe, maybe that's what that is. And just being a little bit uh, more attentive to looking for that. Uh, and then the third element of that is once you, when you do get a bird uh, and, and, you know, suddenly you've seen that chestnut sided warbler that, that you've been hearing singing and it, it pops into sight, stay on it, watch it. You know, what is it doing? Where is it going? Why is it acting like that? And uh, uh, my, my favorite sort of ex uh, story about that was uh, you know, once I was, uh, my very first year of atlasing, I was actually in Northern Ontario. And I actually, I had a, you know, I was doing plots at the same time, uh, we're doing reading bird surveys, uh, but we were also in atlasing mode. And so uh, afterwards, I'm just sort of walking through one of my study areas and I heard one of my Canada warblers scolding. And I thought, okay, so what's that bird? Why is it scolding? What's it doing? Like, you know, maybe there's a predator nearby. Maybe if I follow it, I'll, I'll find it with some young. Maybe it's scolding me. Because, yeah, that often happens. Yes, you're, you're too close to the nest or whatever. Uh, so I tracked it down and went around a corner and found myself, you know, eye to eye with a boreal owl. <laughs> you know, so, you know, being curious and following, you know, what those birds are doing. But more importantly, from an atlas perspective, uh, it's, uh, you know, that allows you to zero in on, on clues that allow you to uh, get better le le levels of confirmations in terms of what, uh, uh, whether, uh, whether the bird is breeding there or not, whether it's carrying food and, and the next presentation uh, uh, will we'll go over some of that. Uh, so final, a final word uh, is, is uh, just in closing is, uh, you know, responsible atlasing. Now, uh, you know, you are an ambassador for birding and for citizen science. Science. And so whenever you're out 
in the field, I think that's really important to keep in mind that uh, we are often in areas where in order to get in on the land, it belongs to somebody else, you're infringing on other people's spaces. So, you know, try, you know, try to reach out to people, try and model that sort of uh, 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 behavior of, of you know, learning, uh, educating people about what it is we're doing and, and seeking their help and assistance. Uh, be mindful of your footprint. Now that's hard to do if you have to drive out to your square as I do. So, you know, I'm obviously putting on uh, kilometers on a car and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, think about, think about alternatives like bicycles and, uh, and, and uh, doing as much as possible on foot and so on and so forth. Uh, and here's something I'm, I'm, I really want to emphasize is be mindful of your potential impact on sensitive habitats. You know, we will encounter interesting little fens and bogs and things like that. And, uh, you know, just just before you walk in there, think about it. You know, is this like is this a, is this a, is this the right thing to do? You know, can I register the birds by sort of working the outside of the area, uh, being attentive to bog plants and flowers and so on and so forth. Uh, which gets me to another question: Is so I found a sensitive species. What should I do? So first of all, you take a glass and you raise it because that's like. The gold standard, right? You found your loggerhead trike pair or your nesting long eared owl, so you know, go you. Uh, first thing to do if you don't know what to do, call Aaron <laughs> because he just loves your phone calls, or call you know your eBird coordinate uh, uh, reviewer or somebody, and 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 we'll 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 sort out a protocol, right? Uh, but our our default should always be to protect the bird, right? So if you found a goshawk nest, well, eBird isn't going to even map that location for you now uh, because of the uh, uh, the captures of of, of goshawks. Uh, uh, for us, we have we hope that in the course of these surveys, we pick up maybe some Lacan sparrows or Henslow sparrows out there. You know, we're very sort of I'm very worried about the uh, you know. Uh, people loving these birds to death, so to speak, which is what did happen to some Lacan sparrows in Ottawa some time ago. So, you know, just if you're if you're if you're not sure, reach out and ask and 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 we can we can talk talk you through that. Uh, I mentioned tapes. Uh, tapes are sensitive or or playback are a sensitive subject. Uh, we do have some birds in Ottawa that are you know more sensitive species. Uh, now the, the the plus side about atlasing, if you will, or the, the the good thing about atlasing is that you're not actually in a place where lots of birders go normally. Like where I'm going, I don't think anyone's ever been to that conservation reserve. There's there's no records on eBird of anyone from uh, any birds from the middle of this area, you know. So you know it doesn't get a lot of pressure, right? Uh, and so using tapes judiciously, yeah, sure, it's actually a good tool. Uh, but be prudent in how you use them. So, you know, my advice to people is don't play them for long, play them softly. And, you know, if anyone tells you that you should be playing your tapes loudly to attract birds, they're wrong. Birds have good hearing, a lot better than mine. Uh, and play, you know, two or three registrations max, then shut it off. Uh, if that bird is close, it will react quickly. If the bird is far away, it will come in quietly after you've shut the tape down. Uh, this happened to me the other day. I had a bird that I, I wanted just to see if uh, I could get something to call that I was looking for. I shut the tape down. Ten minutes later, it came in and called. So, you know, it had, it had heard the initial recording and it had worked its way up to me and then called back, right? So uh, just, you know, be prudent about it and don't uh, use tapes in areas where there's lots of other birders or where there's a sensitive breeding species uh, around. Uh, I think Aaron will talk about how to engage with some of the local people in your uh, in your in your area. But one tool that the Atlas is going to give us is what we call the letter, uh, and this is something that introduces us and says what it is we're doing and looks official and sort of semi-formal. And you can you know print mimeo those off in your basement and then you know carry some in the car or whatever and uh, and hand them out. Uh, I I automatic I already know. Uh, for example, if I talked about access earlier, and I, I guess I left that beside, but if you look at this big chunk of forest, often the question is, and I've talked to people about their squares and you know, how the heck do I get in there, right? It's all private property or whatever. So in this one, there's actually several roads. There's one here, there's one here, there's another trail here. So I've actually got lots of good public access into here. 
but not here. This really nice little road that goes through these really nice little lakes here with all that. You can see it's a very fragmented habitat with lots of different habitats going on. That's the south slope. That's where I want to go. That is like, it's perfect prairie warbler habitat. Not saying there's prairie warblers there, but it's perfect habitat for prairie warbler. I would love to be able to walk through where I'm sort of running the courser right now. And there's this lovely trail that takes you right up into there, but it's gated, right? So I noticed that at the base of the hill, there's a house uh, with a mailbox and a bird feeder. You know, so I'm just going to try and talk to that person, find out who the heck owns that, you know, hunting clamp or whatever the heck it is up there and try and figure out how can I get a, uh, permission to get in here? Because I think this will add lots of interesting birds to the square, but not if I can't go there. Uh, so bird friendly clues like, uh, bird feeders and 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 uh, houses are always a good one talking to your conservation authorities uh so that's it that's all i got i'm done over all right we do have um one question or two questions from sheila although you already answered one of the questions about about speaking points to help us explain atlas to property owners so that will be the letter that will be available at some point i imagine um and the other question is uh, most of my point count spots in my rural square seem to be right in front of people's houses. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to feel very creepy staking out right in front of a house. Can I move over 100 meters so I'm not visible? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, you can, unless the rules have changed, Aaron, uh, you can relocate a, uh, a point count a little bit to accommodate uh, uh, those sorts of local issues. Uh, am I right, uh, Aaron, or did they change the rules on that? I, uh, the point count guidance hasn't been issued yet. Uh, I would err on the side of caution here and say if it's been permitted before, a little bit of flex is available, but uh, there are also 40 point counts that you have as options. And if, uh, you know, point station uh, is number four is this creepy one, well, leave it alone. Yeah. Select another one. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I'll talk a bit about point counts uh, a little later on. Yeah. Um, uh, the doctrine, or sorry, the, uh, the guidelines aren't available yet. In terms of the land over uh, letter, that is available and it's on the website and uh, I just can't find it. So I will, <laughs> I'll post that as soon as I can find it here. I had an email exchange on it just the other day. So I'll uh, get back to you on that. A historical perspective on, on, on point counts. I, I, I worked with the Wildlife Service and they made me do that with my job, right? So of course, when the Atlas rolled out the idea of doing point counts, it's, oh, that's too much like work, right? I don't want to do that. Uh, but point counts are actually kind of cool. Uh, one thing is, yeah, sometimes you just have to, like, you stop. And there's some, like, I don't know, like a generator right beside it. You can't hear nothing. Forget it. Scrub it. You're not, you know, don't bother about that point count. Find another point count. Uh, then sometimes you, you get to a point count. This happened on the last Ontario Atlas. I actually discovered something really interesting, or for me, it was interesting. Uh, I, had, I went down in the Winchester and lots of basically open fields and not a lot of woods. And it was not the most exciting square. Uh, uh, but I had all these point counts in the middle of cornfields. And I thought, oh, really? Uh, but, you know, being dutiful, I did them, um, you know, red and black, blah, 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 blah. And then I picked up a Vesper Sparrow and it was in a soya field. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I need that bird for the square. I would never have stopped there except for the point count, right? So then went to another point count. Lo and behold, another soya field. And guess what? There was another Vesper Sparrow. Uh, so for some reason, in this part of the province, Vesper Sparrows at the time were using soya fields as a nesting environment. I don't know if they still are or why, like why soya is better than corn, who knows, right? Must be some Vesper Sparrow thing. Uh, but yeah, you know, so even those, you know, and, and null data and what seems like bad, poor data is actually good data, right? So, you know, the fact that you've got your point count in the middle of this cornfield and you're only getting five species on it, well, that is what it is, right? And that, that's, the, that's the useful information that the Atlas the useful quantitative information, then the Atlas can help us generate lessons and models around. Great, and uh, good answer. And uh, we have another question that just came in from Jean, and she says, um, I see 
from the data submission site that there is a code that I think allows us not to locate a species on a particular property if the landowner prefers not to have it traced to their specific land. Could someone please elaborate on that? Uh, I'll, I'll delegate on that one. Uh, you can, you could still, you have the option of putting data in at the square level, correct? Uh, and that's one way of vegifying it. And uh, so, you know, then you'll know that you've got what, at uh, 100 square kilometers, right? Uh, that's a lot of territory. <laughs> yeah, um, you can uh, also uh, be safe in the knowledge that the only, other than the scientific team that's going to use the data, right now, the only people that can see individual points uh, are you as the observer and me as the RC. Everybody else sees the data aggregated, aggregated up to the uh, to the square level. So there, that's a little bit of protection there. Great, and that's, uh, that's it for questions for now. Okay, we're going to uh, shift gears here, and uh, let me start uh, uh, the second presentation. I'm going to turn the slides on uh can we see that yep good okay sure can Manmon, the floor is yours thank you welcome everybody it's a pleasure to be here and uh thank you to aaron for doing the slides i had some trouble with my clunky old chromebook here so uh fortunately Aaron's taking charge of the slides. So um, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, we'll be discussing uh, codes for breeding evidence. And I know uh, this might be useful for newer atlases, but maybe even for veteran atlases, as we, uh, we haven't done this for 20 years, so it's a good refresher. Uh, click slides, please. OK, uh, so what we'll be discussing is a general, general review of safe dates and the importance of using safe dates when you're deciding on a code for potentially breeding species. We'll be looking at breeding codes specifically and when and how to use them. And then the interactive portion is a little bit of a quiz we'll be, where we'll be running through a few examples, about six examples, and you can uh, see how you're doing with the, your choice of codes. And then uh, we're ending off with a few small items, uh, what to bring when you're atlasing to help you decide on coding breeding species and what to do if you're uncertain of which code to use. And this will probably happen to all of us, even the veteran atlasers, you might come back and say, I'm not sure how to code that one. So here's what to do. And then just some final notes about breeding bird codes. Next slide, please. Okay, well, the tools are located in that, mostly uh, resources are located in that tools and resources drop down menu of the Breeding Birds Atlas website. And in particular, we're looking at the second last one, which is safe breeding dates. That's the next uh, slide. And once you get to that page, you will see two choices. Uh, one is taxonomic order, which probably you're used to if you're using, if you're used to using uh, field guides and so on. Uh, but there is also an option to look at chronological order, and that's a uh, basically breeding evidence uh, in, in the calendar year, starting from the earliest species, which would be probably the crossbills, and then the latest ones, something like American goldfinch. So you have a choice of those two options there. And when you click on those documents, you'll see the following slide. Oops. Oh. Oh, uh, this is important actually. When you are looking at those slides, there are three eco zones in Ontario, three huge eco zones. So you got your Hudson Plains. If you're fortunate enough to go to the north of Ontario, you'll be using those. And some of you may be using the Boreal Shield if you're located on the western end of our region. But most of you will probably be in the Wick Mix Mixed Wood Plains. So make sure you're on the right page. Um, and I'll show you how you can identify that in a second here. Next slide. So there you go. I've circled mixed wood plains in the bottom right hand side because I went on and I was looking at slides and I, and I realized, oh, I'm on the boreal section. So you don't want to be in the boreal section if you're in the mixed wood plains. So just verify that you're on the right section of the, the, um, uh, those charts that you're looking at. This is what you're looking at. You see those various colors and in, on the right hand side, you'll see a legend. But in the next slide, it elaborates a little bit on that legend. So you can figure out how to read these charts carefully. Here we go. 
So the first color you'll see are those white and light blue, and they both those colors are the same for the purposes of reading those charts. It's just that one line is white, and the next one's light blue, and so on. So that's it's easier easier to differentiate which line you're looking at, and that means uh, you're not using the X code or any code whatsoever. It means they're absent. And then the second uh, color is the yellow. Same thing. You're not using any coding here because here we're talking about migrants. So these are non-breeding. This is not the breeding season. So if you encounter a bird uh, during uh, a period when it's highlighted as yellow, you're not going to mark it down at all. You're going to ignore it and you're going to treat it as a migrant because chances are almost 100% it is a migrant. And then once you get into that middle blue color, the, uh, the medium color shade of blue, that's when you're in the breeding season. However, be careful with coding here because you want to differentiate the migrants from the breeders. Uh, for example, you, um, I remember the last round of atlasing, I was out atlasing in the, at the end of May, and I have the Ottawa Center Square, and I found a morning warbler singing. And I, I made a note of it, but I didn't mark it down as a, a breeding because I thought maybe the chances are it might be a migrant. So I made a note of the location and I came back two weeks later when it was clearly in the safe dates, which is the darker blue. And I was able to relocate that bird and it was still singing on site. And in, in the end, I was get a, able to eventually get a, a confirmed uh, breeder. So uh, don't hold back. If you see something that's uh, in that light blue, in that medium blue section, make a note of it, but come back and double check when you're safely within those safe dates. And then you can be as sure that all the migrants have moved out of the area to squares further north and if that bird is still on site that means that's a territory and it's a breeder. Next slide. These are a few examples. Let's just look at the third one just to save time. So northern water thrush, uh, you'll, you won't see it in January, February, March unless it's obviously a, an outlier and a bizarre observation. But then you have a little window of migration. You're not going to count any northern water thrushes for the last part of April. And even the beginning of May, you're not in the safe dates. So until uh, the 20th of May, if you encounter a northern water thrush in the Ottawa area, you can't be sure if it's a migrant or if it's a breeder that's established a territory. So just hold off until you get into those safe dates, which is that dark blue. Those dates would be the 20th of May to the 14th of July. And if you encounter uh, the species during that little window there, you can be safely assured that uh, it's not a migrant, it is indeed uh, breeding in the area. And then obviously you're trying to upgrade your, uh, to a, hopefully a confirmation if you're lucky. Next slide. Oh, I should mention, uh, maybe back one slide, sorry, Aaron. And uh, don't forget the, uh, the light blue and the yellow on the other side, because after that, after those safe dates, you have uh, post-breeding dispersal. So if you see, individuals of the species at that time, be very, very careful about coding them as breeding because you don't know if they were, they've bred further north or somewhere else and are just passing back through the area on, the worst, on their way south. And obviously um, in the yellow zone, you're not counting them at all. Okay, next slide. The charts are meant to be used as a guide only. Uh, be, uh, just be careful of those because um, there are gonna be variations. Those eco zones are enormous especially the boreal zone. So if you're in the boreal zone uh, in the south part of Algonquin Park or uh, even like the Gananoque area, obviously those dates are going to be very different from if you're in the Kenora area in northwest Ontario. So just be aware of that it's a guide and use it as such. Um, if you're noting birds as uh, breeding uh, during those dates that are not safe dates, Please be very careful because you really don't want to draw attention to a migrant and call it breeding. So be extra certain that it is indeed breeding with some evidence and some note taking to defend your choice. Next slide. Um, so again, if we're boiling this down to the, the, the basics, uh, you want to really separate out those migrants from breeding birds. And so you're not coding anything that's a migrant. Uh, but once it's in the breeding season, you can start coding birds, even with an X. And we'll talk about the Xs in a few minutes. But uh, just be careful if it's not within those safe dates. You want to be careful about counting it as a breeder, unless you have absolute certainty with evidence that it's breeding and with written documentation. Next slide. 
These are the codes. Um, you'll see about 20 codes here. Um, if you're a beginner Atlas, please don't be intimidated by this. There are really about six or seven codes you're going to use on a regular basis, and the other ones very rarely. Um, I like to bring a copy of this with me when I'm in the field atlasing, so that I, it's a quick reminder. I can't memorize all these codes. I really, my memory is like a house fly these days. So I walk around with a copy of this, and it's a, a great help. And I'll get to that later on in the, the slide deck here. Next slide. Uh, this is a version that's a bit easier to read, again, on that tools and resources section of the Breeding Birds Atlas website. And uh, this is a copy I bring with me. Next slide. Now we're in the interactive feature. I think we've got about six uh, images, which I pulled off off the Atlas website. And if you do, this is actually taken from the Atlas quiz section of the website. And it's a bit cumbersome because it gives you the option of choosing any of the codes. I basically narrowed it down for each, each slide here to four codes. And for each slide, we're gonna give you a few seconds. It's kind of a self quiz. So this is a single young bay-breasted warbler, first fall plumage, and it's seen in early August. That's important to note. It's seen in early August, but in suitable breeding habitat. So for this particular example, which breeding evidence should be used? Would it be T for territory, X for breeding season, but no breeding evidence, H for habitat, or FY for recently fledged young? You're, if you want to type it in the chat, go for it. But if you just want to do a self quiz and just do it in your head, go for it. I'm going to give you a few seconds, let's say five seconds to think about it, mull it over and make a choice. Ah, okay. What's the difference between V and AE? We're going to get to that in a second. I'm glad you asked that question. Everybody have a decision? I'm going to assume yes. Before we re reveal the answer, we'll go to the safe dates. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the last line, I've, I did a, a, um, a cutout here. So you can see bay-breasted warbler. So those, those safe dates are the 31st of May to July 31st. So clearly the bird we just saw was outside of the safe dates. Now you may question what you just chose and maybe make a, a, a change in your, your choice, but let's go to the answer then, the next slide. The correct answer would be X. Uh, here we've got post-breeding dispersal. The individual bird you saw may have been, may have fledged in a square to the north, just to the north or further north. And it may be that it's migrating back through the area or moving around through the area. So count it as X. The reason why you're counting it as an X, as X is because it's still within the breeding season. So it, it qualifies as an X, but it's not within the breeding, uh, within the safe dates. So if that's, we'll clarify that a little bit if that was uncertain. Next slide. Here we've got a group of six turkey vultures seen flying in a square with a mix of agricultural and forested habitat in late May. Which breeding evidence should be used? T for territory, X for breeding season but no breeding evidence, H for habitat, or M for multiple singing individuals? So again, I'm going to give you about five seconds. Okay, next slide. We'll look at the uh, chart. So we're looking at turkey vulture, which is... How come I don't see turkey vulture? Whoops, I must have put in the wrong... At the bottom. Oh, it is bottom. It's cut yeah. off on my screen. Okay. Very, oh, very, very bottom, last line. Ah, okay. I can't see it. It's cut off. What do you see there for safe dates? 10th of May to 31 July. All right. So it's within the safe dates. So that means, next slide, you're going to count that as H. So YH, because it's within the safe dates and it is in appropriate breeding habitat, which was agricultural fields with a bit of forest mixed in. And while it's possible that these are not breed, breeders in your square, code H simply means it has a possibility. There's a possibility. It's not a confirmation or a probable. It's simply a possibility. So count it as H, code it as H. Next slide, please. Okay, here we've got a black-capped chickadee, Mark's favorite species. 
It's seen visiting a cavity for a few seconds in late April, but not seen again. So which breeding evidence code would you use in this particular situation? We've got V, a bird visiting a probable nest site. We've got H habitat, T for territory, or we've got AE for an adult entering, occupying, or leaving a next, next nest site, visible or not, or whose behavior suggests the presence of an occupied nest. So here we're differentiating between a couple of codes that are similar, just to give you a bit of a clue. Five seconds. Okay. So here we are, uh, we are looking at black cap chickadee and we can see that it is within the safe dates, so the dark blue section, April 16th to July 28th. And the answer for coding would be V, bird visiting a possible nesting site. Why not AE? Because you simply saw it go in once and that was it. And it may be it was investigating a nest site and then left and that was it. Um, so we're not sure, but we have enough evidence to say V. Next slide. Here's a barn, a bank swallow, which is seen entering a hole in a, in a sand quarry and remaining there for at least a short while. This is during the month of June. So here are your options. T, V, H, or A, E. A few seconds to make a choice in your head. Okay, so this is the month of June. Let's go to the charts. And you can see that it's safely within our safe dates. And if we go to the answer, AE. So here we go. Somebody asked a question just a few moments ago on the chat saying differentiation between V and AE. As it says here, it's not always clear, but AE is a little bit more of a um, a confirmation of breeding. You'll see the bird coming repeatedly to the nest site or staying for a longer period of time rather than just popping in and out. So it suggests an active nest rather than uh, a possible breeding site. Next slide. Here we have a house wren seen carrying a scene carrying small twigs and hair into a nest box. The date is about mid May, and those are your options. You've got T, V, N and NB. And if you read carefully, you'll see that you should be able to get the answer there. A few seconds. Okay, safe dates. It's safely within our safe dates, as you can see from the chart here. And if we go to the answer, here we've got N, N rather than NB. And um, most birds, if you see them carrying material in their beaks, you would code it as NB, nest building. However, the exception would be the wrens as well as woodpeckers. So just be careful of uh, those two groups of birds. There you would code N rather than NB. And that's actually written down right in the code description. Next slide. Rough grouse drumming uh, is heard in, the, in a forest in April. Which breeding co evidence code should be used here? We've got T, we've got D, we've got H, and we have S. Take a few seconds and make a choice. And we'll go to the chart and we'll see that it is within the towards the beginning, but certainly safely within the safe dates for rough grouse. And if we move to the answer, we'll see that it is S. Okay, it looks like a display, but of course the rough grouse is singing and the same would apply for Wilson snipe, American woodcock as well. Although it looks like it's displaying as it's flying um, in the case of uh, woodcock or a snipe. And in this case, it's display. It looks like it dis it's displaying. It's on a log, probably. You would code it as S. Um, and then it clarifies if you were charged by a rough grouse. I have been many times, probably most of you have, at the end of June or July, that you would code DD, distraction display, because it likely has young in the vicinity. And um, 
conversely, oh, back there again, uh, Aaron, just a sec. And I forgot to mention that if you see another individual of the same species nearby, then of course you could code it as P for pair or uh, D. And the same thing would apply for Wilson snipe as well as for uh, American woodcock. Next one, that's it for the little quiz section. Uh, what to bring when you're in the field doing atlasing where to help you with coding. I'm kind of old school. I still use cache. I play LPs. I have wood paneling right behind me. That's not my choice, but it's there. Um, so I like paper and pencil for note taking and I love to bring hard copies of the codes, hard copy of the safe dates and a copy of the square summary sheet so I can see what was found in the last round of atlasing 20 years ago and have a good means of uh, as Mark mentioned, seeing what still needs to be found or what was what the confirmation uh, was for the various species. And I love bringing a clipboard with me and I, I use all those items. Next slide. And what to do if you're uncertain of which code uh, to use for a particular observation. It'll probably happen to all of us, even if you're an experienced atlaser. Don't feel embarrassed or shy. We are all learning, even if you're an experienced Adler, sir, and certainly if you're a newer one, you might have lots of questions. Please don't be shy or embarrassed. Make some notes of what you saw, date of observation, habitat, other pertinent details. You can feel free to ask a fellow Adlerser who may have more experience. I wouldn't hesitate to contact Mark, for example, if I come back and I say, hey, I'm not sure. And uh, of course, uh, you can always ask your regional coordinator Aaron, of course, will have all the answers. Next slide. And some final notes about, uh, oh, final notes about, there we are, final notes about breeding codes. Have some fun with it. Uh, don't get bogged down with all the codes. As you start atlasing, if you're a newer atlaser, you'll see that it's a lot simpler than it seems at first. As I mentioned before, you'll probably use those following the codes you see right there most often, and the other ones much less often or almost never, like brood patch. Uh, you know, I've, I've never used brood patch before. If you're lucky, you might, but uh, those are the codes you're gonna use most often. Remember that even seasoned birders make mistakes. I certainly make my share of mistakes. And if you're a beginner atlaser especially, don't forget you have five years of uh, work to do on your atlas square and it's a great learning experience. So you might feel like you're out of your comfort zone in year one, but as you move through years two, three, four, five, it'll get more comfortable. Don't be shy to ask for help, advice, support. And if you're a newer Atlaser, uh, find a mentor or go-to person for questions. This year, of course, COVID safe, but hopefully that'll change as we move into years two to five. And just a final note, just to be uh, extra aware that obviously we're in a pandemic situation, and uh, so just be careful, keep yourself safe and keep other people safe as you're conducting your Atlas work. And hopefully this will change, obviously, years two to five. And that's it, that's all. All right, so we do have a few different questions. Um, one thing I just wanna point out is that I just learned that uh, rough grouse drumming is actually singing and not display. So I need to go change a uh, recent checklist that I put in. Hey, um, excellent, there you go. So first question from Sheila. Um, actually, I think we have one. Yeah, so if you see a bird carrying nesting material, building a nest or carrying food, so essentially confirmed breeding codes outside of the safe dates, can you count it? Yes, you can. Because that's, that's solid evidence that you have a breeding bird, even if it's outside of those safe dates. So please do go ahead and do that, but have some written notification just in case somebody asks you, hey, are you sure that bird was breeding? And then you can say, yes, indeed, I, this is what I saw, and this is what I made note of. So yes, you may. All right, next question from Nick. Um, so we're having a crazy early spring thus far. Does this put pressure on the front end of the end of the safe dates or is it simply stick to the sheet regardless? That's a good question. Uh, and it may very well be that you'll see some interesting breeding evidence maybe earlier in the year, especially if the warm weather continues, although we had snow today. <laughs> uh, but again, if you're outside of those safe dates, just be, just be certain that you really are seeing something that indicates breeding. 
rather than a migrant, because that's, that's really what you want to do is differentiate between that first slide I showed for the quiz section is was a bay breasted warbler and that's a rare breeder in the Ottawa area. You don't want to mark it down as as breeding if it if it indeed is a migrant. So be extra careful of that. Great. Um, let's see, you did cover V versus AE. Um, <clears throat> you have a note that somebody, Paul, has the same paneling as you. So <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and actually, if we could see, um, oh, we'll have to wait. I think Aaron is, we'll just have to wait a second to get this slide back up to see what you bring. Or if you just want to cover actually what you bring with you in the field, uh, James is curious about that. Sure, what I bring with me in the field is a copy of the codes. I bring a square summary sheet of the square in which I'm working. In, in my case, it would be Ottawa Center, square 42. I bring a copy of the charts, the safe dates. And I bring uh, my trusty little clipboard here, put all the papers on there, and a pencil. And if, you, if you're in a remote, more remote square, maybe a compass and a map would be useful as well. I'm in Ottawa Center, so pretty straightforward with getting around the square. And extra bug spray, always. And bug extra spray. bug spray, uh, good, a good idea, extra bug spray. Um, and we have a, sorry, I missed a question earlier um, from Linda. Um, once you have confirmed breeding for a species in your square, are you done with reporting that species other than the point counts? Pretty much, I mean, if it's confirmed, it's confirmed, right? Um, now, having said that, if it's, maybe a more unusual species or, um, well, you'd leave it at that. The point counts are used to get density, population density. So that's your indication of density. So you're not too concerned about that when you're doing general, general atlas work. Um, so yeah, you can essentially for that purpose. Yeah, house sparrow, you're not gonna try and confirm house sparrow eight times if you're in Ottawa Center. Uh, James, uh, sorry, I had to step away there for a sec, but I will be showing how to find those uh, key documents that both Mark and Manmohan uh, mentioned just a few minutes ago when I do the wrap up. And I think that's it for questions for now. Um, Super. Uh, one other quick clarification. Uh, the X is often overused, so uh, Mark pipe in as well, but uh, Careful of using that X. You really want to use that X, not for migrants, but you want to use it, you want to reserve the use of that X for the breeding season. And again, if you look at those charts, you'll see clearly what is identified as a breeding season. And that's when you want to use the X and use it fairly sparingly, not for migrants. Um, we do have a, just another, another couple questions. Oh. One question. Um, so James asks, uh, for common species, how many times do we count cardinals in suburban neighborhoods of Ottawa? Um, count them as if, like, con for confirmed breeding? I gather that's the question, yes. I think once is sufficient. If you find a breeding, a confirmed breeding evidence of a cardinal, you can leave it at that. Unless you love cardinals and you just want to, you know, go around and search for cardinal nests, go for it. Uh, we're, we're blessed with uh, Kevin and Pete uh, on, uh, on the call as well. If, if you want to chime in here about that, I, I, um, there is a view that the data is going to be used in all sorts of interesting ways and that if we have multiple hits on Cardinals, maybe we do include them. Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, if someone, if someone wants to chime in there who might be on the technical or the research committee. Uh, can I chime in? It's Pete Blanchard. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that uh, we will be looking at in this atlas is we need that redundancy that you get for how often do you see a robin or a cardinal or whatever. And so it's the same sort of thing as in eBird where they always want you to put in a complete checklist. The atlas is the same because there will be a lot of species that will be probably not your cardinals and your robins. But there are a lot of species that will be sort of common enough, but a little bit uncommon. And you really want to know, what we really want to know is how frequently do you observe them in this part of the world versus farther to the west, to the south, or the north. And so really, they're really relying on people submitting full species checklists each time you go out. Whether you actually have to put breeding evidence on them every single time, once you've got them confirmed, I'm not sure about that but at least putting them on your checklist and saying, yes, 
I did have three more cardinals or two more robins. That's uh, that's important. So for, I'm just looking on my other computer here at an analysis that I'm looking at where, you know, you can see in this part of the world that 61% of, of uh, checklists in the breeding season have robins, 52% uh, have blue jays and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of data that they will be using. Then the nice thing about having it is that if an, 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 an analyst wants to subset the data to say, I only want to look at what's been found during safe breeding dates, and you found your bird before the safe breeding date and marked it as confirmed breeding, it's going to get lost if you didn't also put something else during the breeding, safe breeding period. If I, if I could uh, jump in here, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is something that old timers like me will find interesting. And you remember from my presentation, I said, uh, you know, less less atlases, more squares, and uh, a whole of square versus a pointier uh, approach. The data collection approach here is a little bit different. And it, it, it like eBird, it's very flexible. You can enter data in all sorts of ways, right? You can do it online with your with an app that will come out later, and Aaron may speak to that either on this call or in some uh, subsequent call. Uh, you can enter it on your desktop, et cetera, et cetera. They, they're not encouraging to enter it on cards and mail them in like we did the first time 40 years ago, uh, right? <laughs> uh, but one of the main difference psychologically, like the, the, you know, getting your mind around it, is that before you had your app, you had a card and you'd go out and say, okay, I have a brown thrasher, I got it as singing. And then the next time you'd go out and you say, oh, I've got a pair now. So you cross out the singing and put in a pair, right? And then you try to sort of, it was like bingo. You try and move the birds over into the confirmed uh, category. And, and once, and as, uh, as uh, Mama has said, once you, once you got that, you know, nest was young of brown thrashers, you know, tactically, you just sort of ignored brown thrashers from that point on, unless they were, you know, mobbing an owl or something. Uh, now the data collection approach is very different. They want you to do it on an eBird-like individual checklist basis, uh, which is really fun and exciting. And uh, anyone who's into eBird will already sort of be doing that anyways, because that's what you want to do. Uh, but what it does is it allows you to collect a lot more data. And so for each checklist, to a certain extent, stands on its own. But uh, what I'd like to leave with you is that, sure, that's great. But keep in mind that particularly if you're the principal atlas or you're trying to get the picture of what birds breed or do not breed on the square. And so, you know, you may want to put less effort into recording and digging out that third or fourth uh, house wren nest or whatever it happens to be and think that maybe spend that time looking for something else uh, and, you know, sort of allocate your, your, your time accordingly and your effort. Uh, and just one thing, going back to the codes, you know, your, you, everyone will find their own codes that work for them because if some people are really good at finding nests, great, go to it. I, I am not one of those people. Uh, but, you know, there are certain codes that you will sort of find that are you're good at detecting. And, and just to let you in on a secret, mine is carrying food. I mean, to me, that's the go-to code. You, you, you see that yellow orb where, oh, just, what's it doing? Oh, it, it just caught a bug. Did it eat it? No, it's carrying it. It's taking it somewhere. Good. Now I've got it confirmed, carrying food. Right. Hey, just have a couple other questions. Um, one that I missed earlier. Um, so if there had been back to the, uh, the vultures circling over good habitat, um, if there had been more than five vultures over or seven or more vultures, would that have changed the breeding code at all? No, because they're not counter singing. So that, that code for M where you have multiple individuals within a, a square, that would be birds singing and you can identify that there are multiple territories in that where you happen to be stationed. That would be particularly notable if you're doing a point count. You would identify, okay, I hear three American red starts just where I'm standing. One's over there, one's over there, and one's behind me. And in that case, you would count those as, you would, if they have seven or more, then you would count that as M. But in this case, they're just transient birds flying around. It wouldn't matter how many are, you would still code that as H. Okay, and um, another question that just came in is, uh, how would you approach, or what would your approach be when you have a bird whose territory seems to span across the borders of two squares and mm -hmm. one is not yours? How do we know it's not being double counted? For example, a barred owl that might be heard from either square. That's a great question. Um, if you encounter a bird in your square, and 
and you, you heard it first in your square and then it crosses over to an adjoining square, you would count that in your square. But if it's the opposite, then I think you wouldn't count it. Maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Well, I think it's going to be just like eBird again, that uh, you don't know where the nest is. You don't know whether it's in the other square or your square. Right. And so as long as it's in suitable habitat in both squares, then why not count it in yours if it did cross over into yours at some point, even if it was also in the other. Just like an eBird checklist, you would count it on an eBird checklist. Um, a point from Kevin that um, the atlas is a valuable tool for tracking critical habitat for federal species at risk. So documenting every probable or confirmed nesting record for these species will provide valuable data for conservation. So, you know, tracking all your meadowlarks and bobolinks and everything like that is definitely important. Um, and on meadowlarks, um, Jean asks, does anyone know if female metal arcs sing as well as males? I keep hearing what sounds like two in one place, sort of harmonizing. Is it one bird, two males, or a pair? Any, anybody have sure. any thoughts on anybody? that one? That's a good one. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe your guess is as yeah. good as mine. Yep, Kevin's shaking his head as well on that one. Uh, Mark? Uh, I'm Googling it. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Gene, congratulations. You win the best question prize. I, I said in my slide, even experienced birders, the most seasoned birder is still learning. There you go. Uh, that's everybody's internet homework. Go find out if uh, female metal larks sing. <laughs> I, I have this vague feeling that I have seen or heard rather female western sing, but I could be wrong on that. Okay, well, and, and from uh, Andrew, <laughs> probably a pair of starlings. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Michelle and Andrew, congratulations. You win the best answer <laughs> for this evening. <laughs> Love that answer. Okay, uh, are there any other uh, questions before uh, I uh, begin to wrap things up? Um, there's none on the chat, no new ones on the chat. Okay, um, I, I wanna thank our two guests, Mark, uh, Mark Gon and Manmohan uh, Panasar for taking the time to share their thoughts with us uh, this evening. Together you've covered a great deal of ground. Uh, that's critical getting folks uh, ready to Atlas. Before we go, though, I want to remind you of three tools that everyone, whether you're a principal officer or you're just a general participant, the, the tools that you need to review before you head out. Uh, as Manmohan suggested, having them available with you in the field is a great idea, say on a clipboard or whatnot. So one of them is the safe dates chart, the second one is the habitat maps, and the third is the square summary sheet. And I'm just going to go to a screen share here and show you where those are. Do, 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 do. So this hopefully is working. Yes. Okay, so this is the main landing page. Uh, this isn't the signed in version. And you drop down under tools and resources and look for safe dates. And then you'll be brought to that page that Manmohan showed us a little earlier, uh, the safe dates breeding, uh, the updated version uh, posted earlier this month. There's a taxonomy order and a chronological order, and there's the URL for that. So birds Ontario slash safe dash dates. But again, you can get that from the main, uh, main landing page. Don't forget when you're signed in, the structure and organization and navigation is a little different, but that uh, it should be fairly easy to find. The second uh, element to this obviously is the detailed view. And uh, again, we wanna look for the mixed wood plains unless you're in about that 20% of, uh, of the Ottawa region where we're in the boreal or indeed uh, once COVID clears up and we're safer to travel. Uh, if you find yourself along the Trans-Canada somewhere else in Ontario, obviously you're, you'll be moving into the boreal or if you're elsewhere in Southern Ontario. So keep uh, mindful of that. And of course, reading the charts and the colors. Um, absent migrant non-breeding, breeding and migrant non-breeding. And then of course the safe dates, which are also listed on the chart here.
So that's document one. Document two uh, are both found from the Square Resources page, again, on the main landing page. So here's your URL. You're looking for birdmon slash atlas slash findsquare.gsp. So it's under the Tools and Resources Square Resources page. And once you zoom into your favorite square, whether it be where you live or where you're going to go atlas or you know you're going to the cottage or you're on the highway, um, you uh, zoom in or find the code for the particular square, click find square and you're brought to the latest version. This particular square is where Mark is the principal atlaser and you'll see the 40 point count stations are on there as well as two eBird hotspots. So on the next page, you'll find one resource, and that was the map that Mark showed you, that habitat map. It's found here at the very top of the list, Breeding Bird Atlas PDF map. So please visit that. And again, that's that wonderful looking map. Here's an example here in Mark Square that shows you um, how things are, uh, are divided up. Mixed forest, water, agriculture, wetlands, and so on and so forth. And you've got a code here that shows you the percentage of the square that has that type of habitat. So wonderful, wonderful tool. The second tool on the same page, so that's the Breeding Bird uh, Tools and Resources. Um, if you click at the bottom, you'll find the square summary sheet. And this is again, is something that both Mark and Manmohan mentioned. Uh, this is uh, VR52 as an example. Again, you can see some eBird hotspots and the various point counts. When you're logged in, Anywhere that you have made an entry, there will be another little waypoint that shows up for any of your Atlas entries. But under square summary sheet, when you click on that, you're brought to a document that looks like this. And it's wonderful because it lists all the likely species in the, in the square. It tells you what species the highest breeding evidence in the previous Atlas, and it tells you the code of the current Atlas, what the highest breeding evidence is. So already someone has found broad wing hawks in this square. Someone has found singing screech owls in this square. Useful, useful tools that I would uh, uh, hope you have a look at. Um, again, doesn't matter if you're uh, uh, general atlasing or you're an experienced atlaser, probably worth your while to be armed, uh, armed with those. Um, they really are great tools and to benefit from these tutorials, um, I think all our guests will agree that field experience though is probably the most important thing. So when it is safe again, get out there, look at the habitat, think about your impressions of the bird and be sure to simply listen. With one exception, right now we don't have any additional tutorials planned um, at the moment, but I would welcome your ideas at the Ottawa at birdsontario.org address. The sole topic that we are developing is point counts. The timing on that is TBC. In the meantime, please remember that point counts are only done once and principal atlasers have the first right of refusal on point counts, okay? I welcome everybody's enthusiasm, but it's too early for point counts. For those of you who are interested in this great part of atlasing, uh, please know that there will almost certainly be opportunities for you, but the protocols aren't finalized yet. And because we aren't in the peak of breeding season, we really don't want folks going off and doing uh, point counts because then you're going to miss all those wonderful species that are going to be breeding in that May, third weeks of May through to uh, July time period. Um, I think we've got a couple of more questions on here, Vince, before I say goodnight. We do. Yes. Another uh, question from Jean about, can anyone suggest books that have those really useful life history details? For example, knowing that blue wing teal prefer eutrophic lake, lakes. Um, so what are some good books or sources for, for details like that? Uh, open question there, hands on the buzzers. I, off the top of my head, don't have that answer. I've got a good bookcase, but maybe not good enough. Yeah, I know. Um, I know Kevin was just uh, referencing Birds of the World before. It is a paid resource, yeah. um, but for instance, if you're at University of Ottawa or Carleton, then you do have access to it through the library there, um, and that's excellent. That has a ton of information on all the different species. Um, yeah, for a lot of habitat-related stuff, I hard to know exactly. I've, besides Birds of the World, I haven't really delved into many uh, 
many, many resources other than the Sibleys or the Nat Geo or more than that. Sounds like some homework. Uh, I will work on that and see what I can find and I will uh, post either on our Facebook group or perhaps through a, through a general email. How's that? If, if previous, I Atlas, previous Atlas books have a lot of that kind yeah, of information in them. Yep, yep, that's true. The Atlas accounts uh, for the species are, are very handy. Um, the individual species accounts I don't believe are universally available. For Atlas one, they are, but uh, I haven't looked at that for uh, for donkey's years. Um, anybody else? Uh, any ideas on that? Well, the Quebec Atlas is a good resource, and also yep. old time books like Birds of Canada or even Taverners are great for that sort of habitat yeah. information. Yeah, good point. Um, how to make a personal list of square, right? Click gives you no context, no content. Yeah, because you, you actually have to, when you're entering lists, it asks you to name your square or create a, a square name. Once you've done that, then your personal list of squares will start to populate. Hmm. Okay, nature counts. <laughs> Good question, Paul. Um, Yes, you can reset your password, but you have to let me know so I can contact uh, Atlas headquarters to have them do it for you. Everybody has been extremely frustrated with the Nature Counts app. Um, as I have said many, many times before, though, it is still very much in development. It is a basic function. Um, it, I'm frustrated with it as well. I suspect anybody who's on this call or is using it could very well be, be frustrated as well. Folks are working extremely hard to come up with a, um, a fully functional uh, version, hopefully before breeding bird season starts. But uh, in the meantime, we're just gonna have to be patient. Um, I have personally limited my use of the Nature Counts app to single locations. If I know I'm standing here and I pick something up and I'm not e-birding it, I will use the Nature Count apps because it's great. It'll identify my location and I can enter all the data. But if I start to move around or my list gets maybe a little more evolved, I simply take notes. I'll may, I might enter it in eBird if I know that I am um, within one particular square. Um, if I know that I'm in a particular square, I can just import my eBird list and that works. Um, but otherwise, take notes, maybe look at your eBird list and be selective and then populate it on the website. The website, once you remember, and have navigated around on it a couple of times, it actually isn't that bad. Uh, but Nature Counts right now, um, they're working very hard to, uh, to get the bugs and get the work out. And uh, I think when it's finally ready, we're all gonna be really, really impressed with, uh, with how it works. So just, uh, just a little more patience on that. Um, uh, there is a comment there, just use eBird. Yes, uh, you could just use eBird, but one of the huge limitations is eBird does not tell you when you leave the square. If I walk 215 meters precisely to the west of my house, I'm in a new square. So when I do my morning COVID walk, uh, I have to stop and make a point of starting a, a new checklist and uh, eBird has no way of knowing. Um, the other thing is there are some codes that are used in eBird that aren't being used in um, the Atlas. And I can't think of them right now off the top of my head, but I have had occasion to use them and the Atlas wouldn't let me input the list. I had to, again, go back and, and use the Atlas uh, uh, entry. I know uh, there are a number of folks who have done a number of lists quite successfully using eBird. Some of you were nodding your heads uh, up and down. That's great. Um, but uh, if you have login problems, please contact me and I can work with Atlas headquarters to get those resolved for you. Um, any other comments, questions? No, oh, okay, well. Uh, Aaron, I was just gonna add one thing that I, I wanted to say that I didn't, which was uh, it's going back to the time sensitivity issue, uh, which is, your square can change over time, including within the five-year period. And that's really important this year because of cross bills. They'll be on your, might be on your square this year, but not in the next four years. So that's just something to keep to thinking, keep, keep in mind. And I, you might remember I mentioned clay-colored sparrows on uh, the square I was using as a reference point. 
Uh, that's a known spot. They've been there for years. Uh, I was there earlier this year. The farmers were moving the brush, so they won't be there next year. So this will be the last year that I'll be able to get clay colored sparrow probably on the square because that's probably the only habitat. So just uh, uh, if you have areas that are dynamic, like sewage lagoons, also, that's another good example. Birds will nest on sewage lagoons one year, not the next year. So you might have Wilson's fallow oaks on your sewage lagoons this year, but not for the next four years. So just a, just a final sort of something I wanted to say that I, I forgot to say earlier. Very, very good points, Mark. Thank you. Um, so uh, as we're a little over time here, let me conclude by thanking all our tutorial guests and of course, all of you who, uh, who participated. Um, th this went uh, very, very well, I think. Uh, though the tutorial series is very much uh, a local initiative, uh, this weekend we have the virtual Atlas launch on Saturday and Sunday, that's April 24th and 25th. There'll be a whole series of virtual seminars that will go beyond our tutorials. And I would really like to invite everyone to consider participating this weekend. Uh, there will be a link on the Facebook page. You should have received an email from Atlas headquarters inviting you to, uh, to register. Plus, um, there, uh, anybody who's a member of uh, OFO, will have received uh, an invitation as well. So I really hope uh, you'll take advantage uh, of that. For those of you who, for whatever reason, haven't received that email or um, are, are wondering about uh, participating, just going to quickly show you where you can find the information. Oops. So um, if you go to the main landing page for the Atlas, scroll down, there's a new feature there that says calendar. So that's birdsontario.org slash events. If you click on the calendar and then you can click on the Saturday and Sunday to register. They're inviting people to register. I believe it'll be through a Zoom seminar. Uh, I'll be participating and uh, I hope that you will as well. So uh, on that note, I'm gonna wrap things up. Thank you to everyone. Have a great evening and please stay safe. <laughs>